Well, hello there. Uh, uh, I haven't seen you around here before, but uh, I haven't been around here before myself, so it's very likely that uh, there's a reason for that. If only, if only, my train of logic would extend to cover that gap. I could create things the likes of which you would never conceive of. <laughs> Oh, must be the brisket. Anyway, hi, I'm Eshkalar. I am the world's greatest Canadian wizard, and I'm in Mufti tonight without my normal hat and regalia on, because I'm in hiding. You see, the reefer ants don't like it if you come after them with the scissors. And I tried to explain, you know, and I just want a little bud there, and they didn't, they, they didn't want that, so uh, I'm hiding from them, because, damn, are they powerful. You know, they could tear up rocks and throw them at you and stuff, and, uh, and uh, Although I could blast them out of existence with my eep skinny, but my superior wizardly abilities. That's really a lot of effort, you know, and I don't want to do it. So I, I, I'm going to give you a lecture instead tonight. So This is a lecture on the basic nature of magic. I've talked about the wizardly patterns, and that is one form of the basis of magic. But that's the human interface with the continuum upon uh, on which magic users uh, depend for the power uh, with which they do work in the real world. Oh, that almost made sense and everything. So here it is. Many, many years ago, many, 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 many years ago, if you're Manuel Velikovsky, uh, yeah, you might think it was not as long. You know, if, you're, uh, if you're one of the scientists, you might think it was a long time. And if you're one of them creationists, you might think it wasn't all that long. So, but I'm not going to assign a time to this because I know something that you don't. You see, along what we call the myriad ways, it's all the possible fractal dimensions. It's what you would, might call your quantum universes. You know? uh, uh, there is a marked tendency from one end to be older. And then the, the tiny little inconsistencies and the tiny little variations are all the over to this end, where they tend to be of younger duration, you see, shorter duration. And so in the magical realms, tend to be over in the shorter duration side of the myriad ways. And whereas the technology and physics dominated realms tend to be on the denser side, yes, uh, so, or the older side of the universes. So here's why that means something. Uh, during the initial uh, expansion, inflationary, and cooldown periods, uh, attended to what uh, physicists call the Big Bang, but what I like to refer to as Elements were formed, the like of which we would never see again because those pressures and uh, temperatures that we can get today have nothing like the pressures and temperatures of the initial uh, Big Bang expansion and uh, the cool down and the transparency. And of course, the events of the very first uh, generations of proto and superstars. I mean, super, super duper, super duper duper stars, you know, a million solar mass stars. Uh, uh, declining into their uh, more basic components uh, at the end of their very short lifespan, I'm guessing 50 years, 100 years. It was an active time back then. But anyway, these elements that were formed were greater in what we call your nucleon count, your protons and neutrons in the nucleus of any individual atom of that, uh, of that element, were larger than those that can form today. And so, things that we have today that are at the top of the natural formation, you know, like uh, bismuth and lead, and, uh, uranium and all that, uh, uh, those pressures are attended to times that come after the initial Big Bang and its uh, expansion and inflation and uh, uh, cool down and transparency events. So, and these elements that were formed in the initial expansion and all this horrible compression and wondrous you know, expansion of energy into what someday would be called the Planck continuum, from which all reactions ultimately derive uh, the distribution of energy as, as a force throughout our universe. Uh, there were elements created that were very much higher nucleon counts than those we're familiar with today, and some of those elements are uh, what we call the Valley of Stability metals, uh, uh, Dominsk, uh, uh, Acadium, or hackadium, depending on where you come from, you know, ephodium. These are minerals that release a particle that the electromagnetic spectrum of the technological and the physics-dominated universes may not see or, at best, not be able to detect with current equipments. We call them, we wizards call them the Kel. And this Kel particle is much like another gauge particle, the photon, which uh, is the gauge particle of the 
electromagnetic spectrum. Well, think of the Cal as the gauge particle of the magiocentric spectrum. <laughs> oh, my cooler when I made that up. No, they taught it to me. They tried to teach it to me in school. And that's the part that stayed because I, I think I was out of ether that day. But still the point being. These valley of stability supermetals uh, were rather short-lived because even the more stable of them uh, did not have lifespans attendant to the breakdowns of some of our more ordinary uh, uranium you know, and, and other uh, uh, radioactive or, or active uh, materials and uh, elements. So these guys broke down and, oh, I don't know. I'm not going to give you time periods, but... The point being that they have not half-lifed entirely away in the magical continua, you see. But they have mostly uh, become lesser metals and byproducts. Uh, your uh, transuranides, which are very short-lived, or your uranides, which have the, the, the longer existence, and they're byproducts. So, so you guys in the technological universes don't understand the concept of magic, because you don't have the elements from which the magical background field occurs, you see, derives, I should say. And those are called Kells. And those elements from which, uh, from whose uh, breakdown these uh, Kell uh, particles are released are the magiocentric metals, of course, or uh, uh, the Valley of Stability supermetals, uh, Dominsk and Hecadium and, uh, and Ephodium. So, we wizards live in a world that is suffused with these kells, the way that you people live in a world that is suffused with uh, neutrinos, which are not very easy to interact with, from what I understand. And the same thing with kells. You sort of have to be born with the knack, and the knack doesn't come right away. And uh, you have to be in a continuum that is just at that perfect point where it is young enough that there is still plenty of valley stability metals in the basic mix of your planetary core. And they're still giving off kells madly. And so you have a high background uh, magic count so that there is a lot of work that can be done should a person be able to access that standing field of magic. Ah, so there you go. Now, wizards are people who are genetically uh, inclined toward being able to manipulate uh, this force of magic that pervades the entire world. Uh, perhaps the entire Magioverse. I don't know because uh, I was pretty high that day in class and I forgot a lot of it. So, anyway. What we do as wizards is we create a mental condition by our... Well, we create a connection between a mental condition that we, um, that we enforce upon ourselves, hmm? focus upon... Uh, a different state in order to reach a goal. And uh, and then we contact uh, this Kell field, the standing field of Kells. And uh, in that we create a bridge that allows power to flow from that standing field through our eager fingers. Uh, encapsulated in, by our mental state, which we focus in by use of words or dance or hand gestures. Eep skinny bep bep and if I was thinking that through, that would have been a cantrip for cleaning my glasses, which I'm not wearing, which would make my eyes smart, let me tell you. So, This is the basis upon which all magic functions. Now, from the wizard's point of view, he may or may not see that Kell energy around him. Some children are born with the power to see it, and they live within it. It's like the Matrix. You can see it. Ooh, I live in the Matrix. There's no pretty women. There's just a bunch of numbers. Boring. So... Some people live in the magic universe that way. Most of us, as wizards, about age 12 or 10 or 50, something, depending on, you know, how quick we mature yeah, magically or mentally, we'll start dreaming of certain patterns. First, as I've pointed out in my other videos, is the Thotec web. And then, the Thotec, not, I'm sorry. And then there's the Nectar web. And then there's the um, Pacchio wheel. And then eventually, you start being able to conceive of your own dream patterns that are combinations of these and also your own research, things that you have discovered, and things that you have improvised because wizards are cool. And uh, those are called the Shalimar infusions. But getting back to it, the basis of this. Uh, when a wizard's young and starting to go through puberty or starting to go through mental uh, catalyzation, let's call it, uh, you may start dreaming of a certain pattern. I call that the Thotechnot. And general wizard schools refer to it in my world, at least, as the Thotechnot. And once you do, 
you will find that you will be able to gain if you work at it. Now it has to be worked at. Uh, uh, an ability to interact with small parts of this pattern. And each of the parts of this pattern, in each of the quadrants, and each of what I call the, the noodle packets, or the ramen packets, each of the pieces of the pattern inside the pattern, can be used to form this bridge by which you access the standing Kel field. And so you create a mnemonic device that reminds you of how to feel when you want to do that work. And that's called spell casting. <laughs> Ho, ho, ho. The truly great wizards, the wizards of chaos, like Eshkeler, like me, uh, credit where credit is due. Uh, we get where we are by free-forming spells. Above a certain level, you start to be able to just feel the magic around you, or maybe even see the magic around you. And so you'll kind of get an idea as to what your Kel level density is, and how much magic you can create in a certain area, and what kind of a spell you'll need to create a certain effect. Say you want to dig a hole 10 feet across and 10 feet deep. And uh, there was a weak Kel field around where you were for whatever fluctuation. Somebody's been doing some magic or demons been summoned or something terrible. Or something wonderful. Uh, angels visit you. And, uh, <clears throat> and you find there's not quite the high Kel strength that you expect uh, you know, in your local ambience. And so you may have to throw a very powerful spell in order to get a more ordinary effect just to be able to maintain and to gather and to maintain that high a concentration of Kel energy in order to do that work. So, in a very magically depleted area, Fireball, which is usually what I call a third level spell. It's a, it's a Nectar web spell. Uh, fireball might go all the way up to the Pactia wheel spells. It might become a Shalimar infusion in a very magically depleted environment, like yours in the technological universe. Which is why you don't see too many wizards in your side of the universe because uh, of the myriad ways because uh, it takes so much effort to get there even all the faith that you need just to get there to the point where you can start trying it uh, it's just prohibitive, prohibitive now you lawfuls may try it but uh, you will crash yourselves against the law of uh, boredom so, you know, we chaotics are much more readily uh, amenable to that basic concept of how the universe works for so fontic and intelligent creatures. <laughs> That's why dolphins play. It's not all violence and holding the female down. Yeah, yeah, some of it's just fun. That's true. So anyway, <clears throat> now I've explained uh, the two things. One is why, where the standing Kel field comes from, and why there are stronger force forms of magic in uh, some worlds than there are in others, uh, some universes than there are. In others. And I've talked about the major, the basic interface between human or wizardly creature, or whatever you are, and the the, the standing Kelfield, and that's by use of these dream patterns, um, the Thotek web, the or Thotek not the uh, nectar web and the Pactian web, and then eventual fusion of these and other ideas that you've come up with yourself or learned from your role models, or read off a scroll, scrolls. <sighs> Uh, to create what we call the Shalimar infusions, which are the very highest level spells. Spells that in a high Kel ambience, like I live in in my worlds, uh, in my universe, uh, which we call uh, World Prime, by the way. Your universe is number 27P or something like that. So, anyway, uh, I can throw a, a meteor swarm. <laughs> I've talked about that a few times, so I'm not going to go. That. But the, the but chances for punchline overload in something like Meteor Swarm are pretty, pretty high. And for you guys that are into statistics, you, know, you think I believe in magic. <laughs> so, yeah. so there you have it. Uh, a wizard has to have a genetic knack for using magic. And if he or she does, you will start dreaming these patterns at some time during your growth. And the first one you will see is the Thotek knot. Everyone sees the Thotek first. Aliens, you know, higher plane, lower plane dwarves, they all see the Thotek knot first. And that means that they have wizardly potential and they will be able to, if they work at it, start to produce cantrip effects and then minor spell effects and eventually greater, greater spell effects that will be limited by your standing Kel field in your area. So if you're in a technological universe, your Kel field may be so weak that it will require you to do Shalimar infusions of the highest order just to create any magical effect at all. Look, honey, I made this cigarette. 
Dear, you burned the house down. Oh, okay. So uh, I made a cigarette. We can light it off the house. All right. So that's my basic lecture, my wandering, meandering lecture, uh, Escalar lecture in uh, magic. And uh, now before the tree and start smelling this, uh, some other arm I was smoking. <laughs> I'm going to get off and I'm going to talk.